Thank you. <clears throat> That's a blessing. He just takes that stand with him, just sets up wherever he wants to. I need a pulpit like that, right? I just carry it with me wherever I go. Uh, Mark chapter 14, and we were talking this morning about good intentions, and uh, you are obviously uh, well-intentioned people. You came back to church on a Sunday afternoon. Some of you are just glad to be out of the house for the first time in a few days, but I appreciate you coming. <clears throat> and I was telling one of the men in the back a while ago, uh, we're not making any changes, but uh, I, I don't get upset about being done at 3.15, getting you heading to the house, being done for the day, you know? Um, sometimes these kind of changes are good for us just to kind of get us out of our routine a little bit. And uh, my wife and I were talking even last week, you know, we're coming in last Sunday and knew that there would just be a small group of people here. And uh, Renee said, you know, it's kind of fun. It's just, it's different. Uh, of course, she, she liked it when the electricity went out the house. She's sick like that. And uh, I was telling somebody the other day, I said, you know, uh, I think it was 2020. It was either, uh, not 2020, it was uh, 2000 or 2001 when we got to 20 inches of snow. You remember? And uh, we were without power for like three or four days. And we had a, I went and got a kerosene heater and we're cooking soup on a kerosene heater and catching water off the gutters the downspouts to flush the toilet, and my wife is saying, this is so much fun. I'm thinking, you need to see a doctor, all right? This ain't no fun, but, um, but sometimes uh, just a little jilt in the routine uh, I think is good for us and, and helps us. So we're talking about having good intentions, and, and if you were not here this morning, uh, Peter, when Jesus predicted uh, the betrayal of his disciples, Peter said, that'll never happen to me. And I think he's very sincere and uh, very well-intentioned. I believe he, he thought that's what was going to happen. Uh, and then we, we uh, said that there are some enemies of good intentions. Uh, when you disregard warnings, disregarded warnings. Um, I, I want to stop this afternoon and say this. One of our men and I were talking this morning. Um, you know, there were things when I look back as I look back on my years as a young person, as a teenager, uh, there were things that my parents never allowed me to participate in. They just never did. And uh, not all of them were sinful. They were not all sinful things. Um, but, but you know what? It did, it did not hurt me. Do you understand? It didn't, it didn't hurt me that some people said, you know what, we're just not, we're not comfortable with that. That, that, that could put you in a, in, a, in a position. As a matter of fact, looking back, a lot of the trouble that I got into, and I didn't get into major trouble, but trouble that I got into as a young person, I wish someone had been more strict. Yeah. Now, don't ask me to say that when I'm 15. <laughs> but, but as an adult, there's some things that... It, where, where I, I got into some trouble that I never would have gotten into if someone had said, no, no, we're not, we're not, we're not going to do that. Uh, I'm certainly not going to be bitter because, because our church believed some things. Our pastor preached some things. My parents enforced some things. Um, I'm, I'm going to be grateful. I'm going to be grateful for that. Where would my life be? How, how would my life be different if I had not been told as a young person, um, you, you don't have any business with drinking alcohol at all? How, how would my life be different? I, I don't know. Maybe, hey, maybe I would be a social drinker and I could handle my beer, maybe. Or maybe I'd be an alcoholic. See, young people... Don't, don't always push back against the rules. It's, it's not, it's, it, one of these days you're going to grow up, you're going to get to make choices for yourself. But you ought to thank God. Every teenager in this room, every young person in this room, if you've got parents, a church, you go to Christian school, there's somebody over you who's saying, we don't do this and we don't do this and we don't do this and we don't do this. You ought to thank God for that. And by the way, most of you one day will. Yeah. Now there, there will be a few who'll whine. 
and, and, and complain because it was so strict. Uh, but man, you know what? I'm, I feel pretty good. To, I feel pretty good this afternoon. I start saving night. I feel pretty good. If I do, it don't matter. It'll be, it'll be tonight for, for long. I feel pretty good about the fact that, that for me, and that doesn't mean I'm going to go out and try one. It does. I, I don't have, I, there's no, attra- alcohol has no attraction to me. I, I'm, I'm glad about that. I'm thankful for that. I don't know that it would be that way. I don't know that it would be that way. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful tonight that I'm not that I'm not addicted. I'm not addicted to, to tobacco. I'm not addicted to any kind of drugs. I'm grateful for that. And, and a lot of that is not because of some spirituality in my life. It's because some people said to me, uh, you don't want to do that. That, 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 that. That's not going to be in your best interest. But we know this. Peter disregarded all the warnings and his good intentions uh, never, never came to fruition. Evil communications. Uh, no, one, no one was willing to say to Peter, uh, hey, Peter, man, we need to, you remember what he said? Those are friends. Those are real friends. And uh, I look back now, and uh, the teachers who made me do things I didn't want to do, I realize now how much they love me. And, and, and no teacher wants to be a bad guy, a bad woman. Nobody, nobody wants to be that teacher. But you know what? That teacher in your high school and elementary years, that teacher becomes that teacher. Who 20 years later you say, I thank God for that lady. I thank God. I've told you this. Mamie Browning. Mamie Browning was my, was my English teacher in the 10th grade. And I did not like her. I think I hated her. And she was my English teacher, and we had to get up in front, of the, in front of the class, and we had to diagram sentences, which I thought was utterly ridiculous. You know, and I'm, I'm not by any means. I have to have everything I do proofread, but, but uh, I had no idea then I was going to spend most of my life writing, almost all my life, writing something somewhere sometime. But, but thank God for people who are willing to tell you what you're not willing to tell yourself. Uh, and then the third thing this morning was neglected opportunities. He, Peter, James, and John were given the opportunity to go and pray with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we know that they never took advantage of that opportunity. They, they slept through it. Uh, enemy number four, carnal living. Carnal living. What happened? Well, look at verse 34. This is that neglected opportunity. Uh, he left them there. Verse 34, he said unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went, toward, went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but thou wilt. What such a monumental day uh, for us. Verse 37, and he cometh and findeth them, who? The privileged ones, the ones who were given the opportunity, the three out of the multitudes. He came and he found them sleeping and saith unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou, couldest not thou watch one hour? Now, I don't think he's asking Peter, are you sleeping? He's saying, you're sleeping. What in the world? You could not watch? You could not pray for one hour? What in the world is wrong with you? We find the answer in verse number 38. Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. Here it is. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. So he tells, he tells the three to stay, and he goes and pours out his heart to God, and he comes back, and Peter, James, and John are sleeping, and he tells them why they did not stay awake. You know why he said? Because your flesh is weak. Now let me help you. Anytime my flesh has its way, it, it has the power to destroy good intentions. Go to Romans chapter 7. 
I don't know if you figured this out yet. I'm still learning it, but I, 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 I get it. I get it. There ain't nothing about my flesh. There's nothing good about my flesh. Nothing. And I know Brother Ken was right. You're, you're full and sleepy. Bear with me. We, we're going to do well. We're going to get you out of here pretty quick. Look at verse number 18, Romans chapter 17, verse number 18. Paul, anybody here think you're a better Christian than the Apostle Paul? I wouldn't think so. Here's what Paul said. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. Here's what he said. I want to do right. I want to do right. I want to do well. I want to do the right thing. The, it, it, the will is present within, within me. He said, but you know what I find in my flesh? There's nothing good about it. And I don't even know how to perform that which is good because my flesh is so carnal. Look at verse 21. Verse 21 of Romans chapter 7. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But, there's always a but, isn't there? I, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? So Paul says, I want to. You know what he's saying? I've got good intentions. I've got good intentions. I want to. I plan to. I desire to. But what I find is that there is a law present that every time I want to do good, there is something in me that pulls the other way. And, and, and it's like a battle. It wars against my members. It's a constant struggle. Can, any, can I get a witness? It's a constant struggle. And, 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 and my heart tells me one thing and my flesh screams another. And, and, and Paul said, Paul said, I, I, oh, wretched man that I am. Then he asked a question. Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Well, here's the answer, verse 25. I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then... With the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. You know what I'm glad about this afternoon? I'm glad that there is a power available to me to overcome my flesh. And it's the power of the Holy Spirit of God. And I cannot do it by myself, and I can't, I can't will myself to do it. I can't make enough commitments. I can't have good enough intentions ultimately if I do the right thing, it's going to be because of the power of the Holy Spirit, and I do not allow my flesh to rule. Yeah. So here's the question. In what area of your life is your flesh in control? Because in that area, you're being defeated. You're being defeated. Now, we, we don't have a lot of choice. It's a part, I mean, as long as we're here, the songwriter said in, in the song, Sweet Hour of Prayer, this robe of flesh, I'll drop and rise to seize the everlasting prize. But we're not going to drop this robe of flesh until then. And so every day, it's a struggle. And man, my flesh, my flesh sometimes gets the best of me. Carnal living, carnal living. By the way, you're either car in every, every moment of your life, you're either living carnally or you're living spiritually. Right. And there's no middle ground. Every decision that I make, I make a carnal decision or a spiritual decision. We talked about discernment Wednesday night. Do you know who helps us with discernment? The Spirit of God. Right. And the Spirit of God says, no, 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 you, you don't, that doesn't need to be said. That's the Spirit of God that gives us discernment. So an enemy of good intentions we find in this passage is carnal living. Uh, if I'm con controlled by my flesh and not by His Spirit, my good intentions will take me nowhere. My flesh will always let me down. It will limit me. It will disappoint me. And what I need tonight, this, tonight, what I need this afternoon is the same thing you need this afternoon, and that is the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Number five, long distance following. Long distance following. Look at verse 54. 
Back in our text. And Peter <clears throat> followed him afar off, even into the palace of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself by the fire. Are you close to Jesus today? Are, are you as close as you once were? You see, proximity matters. It matters. Because if you had asked Peter, Peter, are you following Jesus? He would have said yes. But the Bible says he followed him afar off. The Bible didn't say he wasn't following him. Do you see it? The Bible didn't say he, he was not following him. The Bible said that he followed afar off. You remember when Peter first encountered Jesus and, and, and he, wasn't, he wasn't about to let that boat come between him and Jesus? Do you remember? you remember? And uh, Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And you know what the Bible said? Peter forsook all. No, no boat, no business, no nets, no, 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 no friend, so to speak, will come between me and my Savior. That's, that's called following closely. But now, three years later, he follows, he follows afar off. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this and... We'll have a little bit of fun with it. I see it in church often, oftentimes. I'm going to pick at some of you a little bit. I see it in church. I, I see people who, man, they're in tune and they're on point and they're on page and they're engaged and you can tell, man, they're just, they're, they're locked in, right? They, they're in. Maybe they're sitting down toward the front somewhere and, uh, and then all of a sudden, you know what? You start, you start, you start seeing them drifting back, and and they're they're sitting back in the back. It's not wrong. It's not sinful to sit in the back. I'm not I'm not upset with you, except for the partons. I get ticked off when I think about them. But uh, but I'm I'm not so upset about that. But but when people move from sitting down here to sitting back there, not always, but sometimes that's a problem. I'm just telling you. I've been doing this for 32 years. I'm just telling you. And then when they can't get far enough away, you know where they go? They go to the balcony. These people up here, they're on their way out. I'm just telling you. <laughs> Matter of fact, let's all just look at them and wave goodbye. They're, they're on their way out. I, I'm, I'm telling you, I've seen it again and again and again. You know what else I've seen? Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Sunday school, and then they start missing just can't manage to get here in time for Sunday school. Or they can't manage to get back on Wednesday night. And, and, and it's just, there is, a, there is a falling back from where they used to be. You don't believe me, do you? I'm telling you, it's true. It's true. You, you know what? You, we, probably all ought to, we all, probably all ought to stop and just look at where we're at spiritually and ask ourselves this question, am I, am I as close to Jesus as I was? Well, we can have really good intentions. But when other things, see, I know people in our church who 10 years ago, five years ago, they would never miss a church service for anything. Right. And I know a lot of things have changed in technology, and I know, I know oftentimes, oftentimes, uh, you can criticize if you want to, oftentimes, uh, not always, but oftentimes, if I'm out of town and I'm not here, I'll, I'll, I'll watch live stream, okay? Because I know exactly what I'm going to get. And, and, and if you think that's wrong, that's fine. Um, but I learned a great lesson. You can fish and watch live stream. The same. It's awesome. I'm just telling you. No, sometimes, sometimes I do that. We used to, we, we take a family vacation every year and the kids started getting married. And so there's like 14 of us, 15 of us, 16 of us. I think now it's like 18 of us. 
And uh, we would go up to the mountains, take a vacation, and we'd go into a church service, and there would be 18 of us, and everybody was over 70. <laughs> and there would be six of them. And, uh, and it, it, it became, and then, you know, you never know what you're going to get. But, but there, there are people that I know who used to, you just would never let anything come between you and church, and it's not that way anymore. I'm, I'm, not even tell, I'm not telling you you're not right with God. I'm just telling you, you ought to look at that. You ought to look at that. Chances are, if you needed church 10 years ago, you need it now. So much the more as we see the day approaching. But, but there, was, there was a long-distance following in Peter's life. And I'm sure if you had gone to Peter and said, hey, are you still following? Hey, Peter, I hadn't seen you, man, in three years. I remember that day. I remember that day when you said, hey, I'm going to leave all my, my boat, my nets, my business. I'm going to follow Jesus. Are you still following? You know what I bet? I bet you. I bet you he would have said, absolutely. But he wasn't following close like he used to. An enemy of good intentions is long distance following. And then, I don't know if I like the wording of this. It's the last one. Look at verse 54. Peter followed him afar off, even into the palace of the high priest. And he sat with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. And I wrote this down, worldly posture. Worldly posture. It, what is it? It's an enemy of good intentions. The, this world is not a friend of God. And I know some of you who don't like some of our positions bristle at this. But we're not supposed to be like the world. We're not. Had Peter not been, in verse 54, sitting with the servants, I wonder if he might have been standing with the Savior. But you can't do both. You can't sit with the servants and stand with the Savior. It's impossible. I'm well aware <clears throat> that anytime a Bible preacher emphasizes biblical separation, they are cast into an, with a group of people and labeled with certain terms that are in many cases very unfair. Look at verse 66. Let's, let's see what it says. We're almost done. Some of you look like you're entering into a coma, so uh, we're not going to be much longer. And as Peter was beneath in the palace, there cometh one of the maids of the high priest, and when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked upon him and said, And thou also was with Jesus of Nazareth, but he denied. Now, now, now let's, let's look at this as a whole. If he had been standing with Jesus, do you think he would have denied? If he'd have been right there standing with Jesus, do you think when someone said, are you with him, do you think he really would have said no? I don't think so. Why did he deny? I'll tell you why he denied. Because he was sitting with the servants, not standing with the Savior. But he denied saying, I know not, neither understand what, uh, neither understand I what thou sayest. And he went out into the porch and the cock crew once. And a maid saw him again and began to say to them that stood by, this is one of them. By the way, if he'd have been standing with the Savior instead of sitting with the servants, they would have known he was one of them. Do you understand what I'm saying? His position gave him the opportunity to deny. Verse 70, and he 
denied it again. And a little after, they that stood by said again to Peter, Surely thou art one of them, for thou art a Galilean, and thy speech agreeeth thereto. But he began to curse and to swear. Do you think he would have done that if he'd been standing with the Savior? No. No. He began to curse and swear, saying, I know not this man of whom ye speak. So, so see, his, his posture, his worldly posture, destroyed his good intentions. And the further he got from Jesus, the closer he got to the world. And we can have wonderful intentions, and we can have lofty goals, and we can have pure motives. But if you live closer to the world today than you do to Jesus, you're asking for trouble. There's a lot of debate today, and anytime anyone wants to talk about anything to do with biblical separation, they're accused of being a legalist. That's unfortunate. I do believe that there are people who at times do equate their standards. No, that's not the word I want to use. They... They do believe their standards testify of their spiritual spirituality. And, and that's wrong. That's, you understand that's wrong. Right, I've got standards. Okay, there's things, I, there's things I don't do. There's things I would never do. There's things I didn't let my kids do. There's things my wife doesn't do. We have standards. But they don't make us spiritual. So does, so does the military. And they're not all spiritual giants. All right? Um, Standards do not equate to spirituality. And when we, I I believe there is an element of legalism involved when we try to say, well, look at me, I'm spiritual because I wear my hair a certain way, I dress a certain way, I go certain places, I don't go other places. I do think that we open ourselves up to criticism unnecessarily but I'm just going to tell you and you can like it or you can lump it you your relationship to the world tells testifies strongly of your relationship to Christ it does now I know this is, a, this is an open-ended conversation, and we could talk about forever. Okay, okay, then should I be Amish? Right? Because electricity is worldly. Right? And vehicles are worldly. I mean, we, we could sit here and we could talk about it, but, but you know, I know what that talk, I know what that's speaking of for me. I know what that's speaking of for me. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't intentionally attempt to dress weirdly. All right? And I, 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 I don't wear, I don't even know what's in anymore. I've lost control. But I know back when I was, a young preacher, the really wide ties were in. How many of you remember those? Those were awesome, man. Those, you could cover up your belly with those things. <clears throat> Somebody said, did you lose weight? No, I just got a new tie. <laughs> it's, all, it's great. And, and, uh, and I, don't, I don't wear those ties. That's, they're, not, they're not fashionable. You understand, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to help you understand where I'm coming from. But I do know this. I know there's places I ain't got no business going. There's things I have no business watching on television. It's worldly. It's worldly. There, there's, there's, there's things I have no business saying. It's worldly speech. I don't have any business speaking that way. There, there's music I have no business listening to. Listening to. It, is, it is so of the world. 
So what is it for you? Now, we could sit here and we could argue all day about the specifics, but could we just ultimately come to an agreement on this? We're to be different. We are. We are. Light, dark. Well, there's difference, man. There's a contrast between we're, you are the light of the world. Well, I reckon we're supposed to be different. So I'm not going to criticize you if you think that being a little more different is in your best interest. It'd be a good thing if we could just, you know, I'm going to preach what I believe is true and try to preach the Word of God, and we're going to put policies in place as a church, and, and, and we have every right to do that. Okay? But, but it would be a good thing if, as I said the other night, if we would quit trying to be the Holy Ghost and quit trying to convert everybody to our way of thinking. But God will tell you. He'll tell you. You remember, how many of you know Mark Padula? I think Mark and Nikki, they just, uh, Julian just had a baby just the other day. They're, they're, Nikki's a grandma. And I think they moved, somebody said they moved to Florida. But I remember when Mark first got saved, and he had, he had a, a ponytail, a long ponytail. And he heard me say something one day about, uh, about hair. And he questioned me on it. And I said, you know what? I said, uh, let me get some stuff. I, let me, let's set up a time where we can get together. And, and we, we, were, we were planning to do that. And about two weeks passed, he came in one day with this huge grin on his face. And he turned around, he got a haircut. You know why? Not because he read a book, not because I told him. It's because God talked to him about it. God talked to him about it. Some of you, God has told you, you don't need a television in your house. I would listen to God if I were you. But don't get mad because he hasn't told me that. And don't think you're a better Christian than I am because he hasn't told me that. Is everybody with me? Are we good? All right. But, but let's, let's back up. I'm done. Let's back up. Look at, uh, they're just going to put them up on the screen. 2 Corinthians 6, 17, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you and be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now, you can study that out. You can exegete it. You can study the Greek, and you can come up with all these things. But at the end of the day, here's what it said to save people who were struggling with carnality. The church at Corinth. Here's what he said to them. You're not supposed to be like them. James 4, 4, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now I wonder what that means in the Greek. Here's what he said. If you are in lockstep with the world, if you are in friendship with the world, you cannot you cannot stand with the Savior and sit with the servants. That's what he's saying. I'm going to give you one more and I'm done. Look at verse 72 of, of our text. And the second time the cock crew. And Peter called to mind the word that Jesus said unto him. Before the cock crow twice, thou shalt deny me thrice. And he thought their own, he wept. And when he thought their own, he wept. So I'm done. So, I got all these plans. I was 23 when I got in the ministry. When I came here, I was 23. I was 28 when I started pastoring. And I had all these plans. I had all these, all these intentions. Do you know what? And please don't take this out of context and... I, I, I have no premonition, and I'm healthy as far as I know, and I plan to do this for a long, long time, much to the chagrin of some of you. But do you know what I'm beginning to understand? That not only when it comes to ministry, but when it comes to life, I don't have as much time as what I once had. And you know what? I, I'm determined. I don't want to come to the end of it as Peter did and say, 
but I really intended. I really planned. I, 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 I really thought that I would be right there with him. And that rooster just crowed, and I'm nowhere close to him. So tonight, tonight, so tonight, do you, what are your intentions? And then what are you doing to oppose those things that will keep your good intentions from coming to fruition? Let's stand together. Our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. It's the, what, fourth Sunday of the year? I guess today is fourth Sunday of the year. So we, 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 we enter into a year and you, maybe you write down some resolutions, you set some goals, you do some journaling, you have all these plans. Well, four out of 52 are history. And before you know it, it's going to be four months. And before you know it, it's going to be the 1st of July. And half the year is going to be gone. And I do understand that we haven't had anything normal since January 1. But, but, But what are your intentions? Do you have good intentions? And then secondly, what are you doing to offset these things that would keep your good intentions from coming to pass? I'm going to pray, and Ms. Sharon's going to play, and we're going to use the altar. If you need to, this, this afternoon, God spoke to your heart. Father, I pray you'd help us. This has been helpful to me today. You've spoken to me. This afternoon, you've spoken to me. I need your, your guidance in my life. I need your wisdom. I definitely need your power. My flesh is depraved and corrupt. The attraction of the world is so alluring. Yet you said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So enticing. I pray you would help us. And bless these few moments of, of recollection and response. In Jesus' name. She'll play. If you'd like to talk to God about something that he's spoken to you about, I invite you to come.